Anyway, let's back to meditation. So where we have um, some stillness. Where the idea of stillness comes from, the art of disappearing, because once people are still, things start to vanish. Now, I did mention uh, yesterday about going to a Zen monastery where if you nodded, you get hit on the back with a stick, which was, to me makes no sense at all. But also, one thing which I learned going to a Zen monastery uh, in the north of England uh, was that they asked me to do a different type of meditation where you kept your eyes open and you faced a wall. And it was a whitewashed wall. And I was willing to try anything. So I wasn't just um, going to just stick to what my tradition or how my teachers taught. I wanted just to, to see how other people did things. So you sat there, you know, in the morning, just watching this whitewashed wall with your eyes open. Now, because I had already trained in enough meditation to be in the present moment, forget about the past or the future, and to calm my thinking mind, I could actually just watch this wall without you know, trying to think, without fantasizing, without planning, keeping my mind still, just watching this wall. And then what happened was the wall vanished. It disappeared. It just wasn't there anymore. And for many people, you think they put some drugs in the porridge or that they had done something very weird. You get scared. What is going on? My eyes are fully opened and now what I'm seeing is blank. And I had enough courage just to let it be, just to stay there. This was weird, but it was perfectly safe. And then started afterwards contemplating what had happened. And it didn't take long to understand that the nature of the human brain and all of its senses only notices things which change. If there's a hum in the background of the traffic, you will not hear it after a while. It turns off. If there is like an air conditioner or the hum of the, of the uh, uh, fluorescent lights, after a while you don't hear it. The feeling of the saliva in your throat. Now you can feel it. After a while, it will disappear. Because all of the senses only notices things which change. Ambient sound, ambient feelings in the body, you just don't notice. It disappears. Just like on a... a a computer, if you don't click the mouse, if you don't do anything, the screen turns off. And that's what was happening when I was looking at the whitewashed wall. Because I was paying no attention to thoughts, because there's no thoughts going on, I was there in the moment, quiet, just watching this whitewashed wall. It just turned off, the sense of sight. And that was precisely the same as what happens when you close your eyes in, in the Theravada meditation. You close your eyes, and now I can see the inside of my eyelids. After a few seconds, because nothing happens, the sense of sight turns off. It disappears. And this shows you why stillness, when things are ambient, they don't change, they're even why that leads to things disappearing. So, how does that relate to meditation? You sit down comfortably, so comfortably that everything is nice and even. You don't have something which is really bothering your five senses, or especially your, your sense of touch. So after a while, the sense of touch disappears. You can't feel your body. Now that was really important for me in those first years in Thailand. Because we had these terrible, terrible mosquito problems. And I thought that it's something you just had to endure. You know, but afterwards you looked at the Thai monks and they looked at their exposed skin. They had hardly any mosquito bites. All the Westerners, the white monks, had all the mosquito bites. And first of all, I thought, well, it must be because 
This was the first time in that part of Thailand they had Western food. They had Thai food so often before. So when they saw a white mark, hey guys, this is Western food. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> Cold. Sorry? Ah, uh, if it's hot, you keep a cool head. If it's cold, keep a warm heart. That way you're always balanced. <laughs> but going back <laughs> to disappearing. That had all these mosquitoes on you. And I realized afterwards it was because I think the blood vessels of the, the Western monks are actually much closer to the surface. You know, because of the, the adapting to the different climates. Which meant for the mosquitoes they didn't have to drill so far down to get the, get the sort of rich vein of delicious blood. It wasn't because you know, it was white food or Western food and they got fed up with the, the Thai food. It was, in fact, it was easy to get. So what happened was that we get loads of mosquitoes on us. And that first year at Wat Nana Chat, for those of you who have ever go back there, it was first called Wat Bar America Wat, because most of the monks were American. So anyway, that when uh, we went there, so many mosquitoes on us. No buildings, you know, camping out in the forest, in the jungles, you know, with a mosquito nets and watching these snakes roll by. It's really weird. You know, there, and you're just meditating, and this really dangerous cobra would go past. And then this other dangerous banded crate would go past. I don't, it's really weird. Because you were just nice and still, you didn't really worry about it. And they didn't worry about you either. You know, we were friends. Anyway, <laughs> they were Buddhist snakes in that monastery in those days, so they were Buddhist snakes, they were vegetarians, so I was safe. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought. I don't think that was true. But anyway, there we got to uh, being in the forest. And Ajahn Chah would come and uh, do, every evening when we first went there, would come between six and eight to actually do some chanting and meditate for a couple of hours. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. That was mosquito dinner hours. That's when it all came out. And there we were, just sitting there, just, you know, just open slather for these hundreds of mosquitoes. And they knew that when they saw a brown robe and a bald head, they were safe. We couldn't swat them. Many times I thought I would like to, because there was hundreds on me. But then you'd look up at Ajahn Chah, and he was just sitting there perfectly still. I wanted to run away, but he was there. If he hadn't been there, I probably would have run away. But then what happened was, with my friend, we would count how many mosquitoes we had on our arm. A little competition. Stupid young men. Like people actually have a competition of how many chilies they can eat. And it's <laughs> crazy. Men, men do things like that. I don't think women do things like that. Men do. Crazy. Mad. But anyway, <laughs> the, we got to about 70 or 80 on your arm at once. And you can't count anymore. They're too close together. What you can do, you can hear the slurp <laughs> as the blood is drained from your <laughs> That's exaggeration. But it was really hard to endure. So, my trick was, and now thank you mosquitoes for teaching me this, when I was meditating, instead of counting the mosquitoes, I just went inside to be as still as I possibly could. No thinking. No sort of worry, no past, no future, until your body vanished, disappeared. And that was such a wonderful thing, when you could not feel your body, and you went inside watching the breath, and then from watching the breath to inside. And it meant that you didn't feel the mosquito bites, and you had a nice peaceful meditation. You allowed your body to disappear. Now, interesting thing, just um, uh, anatomically, but when I came out of meditation afterwards, I hardly had any like little welts, little bumps on your skin where the mosquitoes would bite you, because that's what you used to get as a Westerner. And I thought, wow, this is psychic powers, magic. When you go into meditation, it's like you get this force field around you, and the mosquitoes, they try and come in and they just can't penetrate your magic force field. But, you know, it's nice thinking things like that, but the truth of the matter was it was totally um, science, cause and effect.
because later on I, I read that mosquitoes, they're attracted to the carbon dioxide coming out from your skin, from your pores. The more that you metabolize, the more that you worry, the more that you think, the more carbon dioxide is secreted, and it's like telling all of the mosquitoes, over here guys, this is where I am. But when you calm down, you don't worry. You're reasonably still, or even perfectly still. It means hardly any carbon dioxide comes out from the skin. So you become invisible to the mosquitoes. That's what it was. And to this day, you may not be able to get into the deep meditations, but at least if you go into a mosquito eating area, the more you worry, the more scared you are, the more anxious you are, the more you metabolize and more mosquitoes will find you. So just even a little thing, just relax. Just don't worry about things. And then you'll be bitten by less mosquitoes. But for me anyway, it taught me just how to let the body vanish and disappear. Just by being still until you weren't cognizant of the body anymore. And that is why we do the Kaya Gata Sati the mindfulness of the body, the beginning of the meditation. The male will to sort of sit comfortably so the body just has a chance to vanish. So you can sit here and you can't feel your legs. You can't feel your butt. You can't feel your, uh, your body, your hands. You can't feel your head. And if you have hay fever like me, you can't feel your nose. Stop it, nose. <laughs> so, what happens is the body vanishes. And you can imagine how peaceful that can be. The smell, taste, and sight is easy to stop. You just close your eyes. Sound, that's a hard one to stop. It's one of the reasons why we ask people to be quiet, to turn off your mobile phones. Because those mobile phones, they either rattle, they, they vibrate, or they, they make a sound, and that sound is designed to disturb you, to draw your attention. So when it's very reasonably quiet, it doesn't have to be perfectly quiet. As long as the ambient noise is just even, doesn't change, then soon you won't hear anything. It will disappear. It's not that hard to do if you have something interesting and enjoyable to be able to put your attention on. There was a Malaysian couple over in Perth and they were watching a movie on the TV in their sofa, in their lounge room. They never told me what the movie was. I'm sure it wasn't a recording of one of my talks. It was something much more interesting than that. And they were watching there just wrapped in this movie and of course, once the movie had finished, that's when they got up, one to go to the toilet, the other one to get a cup of tea. And when they got up, only then they realized their house had been burgled while they were watching the TV. The burglar had been in. And even right behind their sofa, on the, sort of the shelves there, many expensive things had been taken by the burglar. The burglar had been right behind them <laughs> while they were watching the TV. And I told them afterwards, if you could only do that while you were meditating, <laughs> why, is, why is it you can just let go of sound outside of you when you're watching the TV? Because the TV is interesting and fun. It grabs your attention. Which is one of the reasons why, to be able to get the joy up in the meditation, the delight, the happiness, means you don't have to force the mind and the mind can actually stay with one thing and everything else can disappear and vanish. And they even say that people playing football, they can get so engrossed in the game that they can break a leg, literally, have a fracture. And they keep on playing, they don't even feel the pain because they're so engrossed in the contest. We have a little itch and totally disturbs our meditation. The reason is because we haven't got the joy and happiness. So, from the very beginning, when we meditate, just allow the body to feel so delightful and after a while it will vanish because nothing is moving. Then, 
we go to the mind, the peace of it, the past and the future. Just go into the present moment so time can vanish. We're prisoners of time. The present moment is the most wonderful place. You work so hard to get here. Now you're here. Enjoy it. The future is made right now. This is the place you are making your future. So forget about what's going to happen next. Make sure you're putting your attention into where your future is being made. Stay in this moment, nice and being here, and then time vanishes. And when time vanishes, you get to this wonderful stage, you don't know how long you're meditating for, who cares? When the bell goes, the bell goes. You're not so say five minutes left, ten minutes left, I don't know how many minutes are left. When I was a young monk, I always thought that these monks who had control of the bell were always, you know, just torturing me. When I had a really good meditation, they'd ring the bell too soon. When I was really struggling, they were never ringing the bell at all. So I wondered how I could get control of the bell. So I decided to have all these ideas when I was meditating, like to get one of these slingshots, or the pea shooter, even better. These little tubes, you put a little pea in it, a dried pea or a piece of stone. And you'd, you know, you'd practice in your hut, first of all, until you had very, very good aim. And then when people were meditating, and Ajahn Chah was next to the bell. If I had enough meditation, when Ajahn Chah had his eyes closed, I'd get my pea shooter out. And it'd go, gong. <laughs> that was my trick. I never did that, but I thought maybe what a wonderful idea that would be. But anyhow, <laughs> when time vanishes, you don't really care about bells. That is one of the reasons why. If any of you ever come to one of my retreats in Perth, we make sure it's no bell silence. You know what I mean by no bell silence? No bells. You know, it's just like going back to school again. We don't trust you. Bring a bell, bong, gong. There's so many bells. Imagine if they had a bell under the Bodhi tree. A Mara would ring it. Just before the Buddha was about to get enlightened. Gong. Okay, Buddha. Walking meditation now. Bong. Toilet break. <laughs> we wouldn't have a Buddha. So, anyway. So, anyway, the, when we learn how to uh, allow the mind to disappear time to disappear, sorry, first of all. Then, when time disappears, we get to our breathing. Everything else has vanished, and just no breathing left. Uh, former good friend, former abbot, the first spiritual advisor over here in the BS3, Ajahn Jakra, when I first came here, 33 years ago, 33, yeah, 35 years ago now, came to Australia, so right, yeah, 35 years ago, that first came over to Perth, and this gentleman came up and said, I've imported a sensory deprivation tank, the flotation tanks. He said, would you like to have a try? And I thought, oh, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. You know, because in his flotation ta uh, tanks, you, you lay in salt water, which is just about, you know, the same density as your body. So you just float. So you don't have any pressure on any part of your body. And it's just a body temperature, so you never feel cold, you never feel hot, it's just body temperature. You're floating there, it's, it's uh, light, tight, so you can't see anything. It's soundproof, so you can't hear any sounds from outside. They must have a flow of oxygen somehow, rather, otherwise you pass out. And it was just a way of just uh, uh, taking away all sensory impingement as much as possible, so you can float in there and relax. And we have this tradition in Theravada Buddhism, whoever is the senior has first go. Mm. <laughs> so, Ajahn Jakro had the first go, and he went in there, and, and I was due to do it the next day. But that morning, our committee members came and they stopped me from going. And the reason was that that morning there was a big advertisement in the local paper. Flotation tanks! as used by senior Buddhist monks. <laughs> they had tricked us, exploited us, you know, and so I couldn't do it, and I thought, no. Oh. But anyway, I didn't need to, because I asked that gentleman, what was it like being in the flotation tank? He said, well, it's marvellous. He had no bodily um, 
uh, pain or aches at all. It was just totally just floating there, really comfortable, better than being in a bed. It was dark, you couldn't see anything, and you couldn't hear any sounds from outside. But, he said, what he could hear was <gasps> his own breathing. I was thankful that he had that experience because it gave me an opportunity to, to describe what happens in meditation. Because after your body disappears and it gets really comfortable, the thing which is left is your breath. It's still breathing. And it becomes very prominent when nothing else is there. So once you can start feeling your breath, what happens next is something quite natural in the art of disappearing. You're watching your breathing. First of all, I said, just breathing in peace, breathing out, let go. That's just to give you something to hang on to. But after a while, all those words, just breathing in, breathing out, without saying anything, being nice and peaceful with your breath. But remember, at this point, you're not thinking about anything, you're not planning, you're not doing anything. So you're not expending any energy at all, except in breathing and obviously your heart. So what happens is you start to breathe less and less. You don't need so much oxygen. Because you don't need so much oxygen, the breath gets lighter and smoother, and it comes to play a time where you can't really distinguish between an in-breath and an out-breath. Same. And because you're very still, you stood, as I said last night, at Box Hill, you just start getting some energy. Your mindfulness should be quite refined and strong. You start to see things which other people can't see. When that happens, enough stillness, enough power, when the breath vanishes, it becomes so still, it turns off. That's when the five senses are just about gone. And then we become aware of the sixth sense, which is the mind. And many people experience that as this beautiful light which comes up in the, in the mind. It's not that uncommon that people see these lights, these limiters. And they understand what, why it comes. Your five senses, these are, I think I said this yesterday, the five senses are really strong, they dominate the sixth sense of mind, and the five senses get subdued, eyes shut, ambient sound, so you're not really anything to disturb you. Uh, the body is getting very peaceful, disappearing, the breath is getting peaceful, disappearing. And then all that energy goes into the mind, the mind becomes dominant, and you become aware of the sixth sense, which is usually seen as a light. Why is it usually seen as a light? People who have near-death experiences, when they sort of uh, leave their body, they always go to the light. That should sort of tell people what's happening. And when you're dead, five senses stop. <coughs> After they stop, then you go to the light. And if you go to pe ask people, really honest people, sincere people who come back afterwards when they go into that light, really blissful, you know, some people call it pure love, ecstasy, whatever, and you can see that is you know, almost like a first jhana experience. But just beforehand, it's this beautiful, wonderful light, it's very joyful, very happy. This is the art of disappearing. Five senses go, the sixth sense starts to arise. What? That's a nice experience. What's that got to do with insight and understanding? The simile of an emperor. Once there was an emperor, and the emperor was, when appeared in public, was always clothed from head to toe. The emperor had his huge boots, which went up to the thighs, had trousers, which over, uh, overlapped the top of the boots, went way above the navel had a jacket which overlapped the top of the trousers, long sleeves to the wrist and a high collar. Had gloves which overlapped the, the jacket sleeves. And lastly, a huge helmet which overlapped the top of the jacket. That emperor was totally covered with five pieces of clothing. So no one knew who the emperor was. Whether it was Tony Abbott, or, or Mr. Trump, or Kim Jong-un, or uh, 
Rupert Murdoch? Or <laughs> Who was really in control? Was it a man or a woman? Was it Asian? Was it um, uh, Caucasian? Or, we're all Asians. Asians and Caucasians. And Australasians. <laughs> and uh, old or young, all we knew was this emperor was powerful. So the only way to know what the emperor is, is to take all the clothes off. When you take all the clothes off, the helmet, the jacket, the gloves, the trousers and the boots, when you see the emperor totally without any coverings, then you can have an understanding of what the emperor is. And of course, in that simile, the five pieces of clothing are the five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and physical touch. And the emperor, the emperor is your mind. The thing which is the most important thing inside of you. Which makes lots of decisions, which controls so much. So, now, in order to find out what this mind is, we take off those five senses. When they disappear, you've got direct experience of the nature of this mind of yours. And any stupid scientist who said the mind doesn't exist, it's just a byproduct of the brain. If they get into even that part of meditation, they'll find just how stupid that is. That mind is very powerful and it exists independent of the five senses. There's many, many examples of the five senses disappearing. One of those examples, I love telling this, it was one of my disciples, it's so long ago now that I can tell the name Greg. He was a meditator over in Perth, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes at most. Sunday afternoon, nothing on TV, so he decided to meditate. Told his wife, just go in my bedroom to meditate for half an hour. After an hour, an hour and a half, he hadn't come out. So his wife went to check on him. When she went to check on him, he was sitting there perfectly still. Too still. She couldn't see his chest go up and down. It looked like he wasn't breathing. She couldn't see any breath come in or go out. So she rang, zero, zero, zero. And the ambulance came within ten minutes. And the medics ran into the bedroom. They checked his pulse. No pulse. So they put him straight onto the gurney, into the ambulance, and rushed him to the hospital. Do, 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 do. As the sirens went, this was a matter of life and death. Do, do. Going through the red light. Do, 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 do. This was really touch and go. He wasn't breathing, no heartbeat of discernible. Do, 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 do. Straight into the emergency, rushed him in, triage nurse, straight away. This was emergency, it looked like he was not breathing. They put on the ECG, EEG, both flat lines. Ding, 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 emergency, ding, ding, ding. Apparently, ECGs and EEGs don't do that. But I'm not allowing the truth <laughs> to stand in the way of a good story. Everything else was true. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> but it was flat lined. So the doctor on duty, good karma this guy Greg had because the doctor on duty was an Indian, the son of Indian migrants, and asked, you know, what happened? He was meditating. And his parents had told this doctor, their son, that some yogis in India through deep meditation could suspend all their life activities. They're not dead. And interestingly, that the only difference the doctor could discern between a live body and a dead body, the only thing which was a bit strange, was that his body was still warm. And that's exactly what it says in the suttas. For those, when he said that, did you know that that's what the Buddha said? That's how you distinguish between a person in deep meditation and someone who's dead. Check their body. It remains warm. So anyway, put defibrillators on the body. You know, this big electric shock. Boom! Boom, boom, and nothing worked. He didn't actually say for how long he was like that, but after a while he just decided to come out of his meditation. And he just opened his eyes and he just looked up and said, What am I doing in here? I was in my bedroom. How did I get here? Very good. How did I get here? And of course, and as soon as he opened his eyes, bing, bing, all the ECG, EEG working perfectly. 
And the doctor gave him a thorough examination. Nothing wrong with him, couldn't find any fault at all. So it was a Sunday afternoon, just told him to go home. And he walked home with his wife. He says it was a totally pleasant experience. The only downside of the experience was the scolding he got from his wife on the way home. She really gave it to him. He said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> I thought you were dead. I remember him telling me about the experience. But the important part of that experience, he was totally safe. And in such a deep meditation, these are the jhana states, you can't even feel defibrillators on your body. You can't hear the sound of the sirens. That's why I kept on going, du-du-du-du-du-du. Couldn't hear anything or feel anything. But totally aware. But of the sixth sense, the mind, deep inside, that's classic art of disappearing. So what we're doing here, we are allowing these five senses to vanish so that we can just see what's happening with this thing we call the mind. It's also very joyful and very healthy. When one of those experiences I had was having typhus fever in Thailand many, many years ago. There was just no one knew what it was. We are not supposed to have typhus fever in that area. The only reason we didn't have it diagnosed properly is because no, Thai, no local had ever got typhus fever there, so it was not supposed to be there. But the Westerners came in, locals had natural immunity, we didn't. So when we got this fever, they thought it was typhoid. It was pretty much similar sim symptoms. But after a while, they realized this wasn't typhoid, this was scrub typhus. So I remember getting that three or four weeks. And then, if you've ever had a big fever like that, you just feel, Ugh. Never had such low energy before. And felt very tired, very exhausted. That was a time when our most compassionate master, Ajahn Chah, he came to my bedside, and I was just so uplifted. Oh, this marvelous master was so busy, he came to visit me. I felt so great until he opened his mouth. And then he said, Brahma Wang, so you're either going to get better or you're going to die. And he turned around and left. <laughs> his wisdom was, un was unquestionable, but his bedside <laughs> manner left a lot to be desired. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn Chah. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so anyway, what happened was one afternoon, I just, in the middle of a fever, I thought, oh, this is too much. So I thought, you know, do your meditation. That's what I'm a monk. So he just lay there, and as I meditated, just let all the body go, vanish, disappear. And that was just a wonderful experience. Mostly because of what was happening before, really aches and pains of a fever, no energy. You can understand. So that when you meditated, go deep inside, things vanished. And then, so much joy and bliss. When I came out of meditation, the first thing I noticed was the posture. If ever you've been in a hospital, sick, you know, with a fever, one leg is this way, one leg is that way, the hand's all over the place. I wish someone had taken a photograph of me. The great meditation posture, that worked. <laughs> but it was all over the place. Nothing you'll ever see in any book. But the point was, my body was happy and it could disappear. That's the whole point of the posture, allowing the body to vanish. And of course afterwards, I wish I would have known about this, but pretty sure that's where the fever disappeared. In those deep meditations, there's huge amounts of, of stuff happens. Even recently, this guy in Penang, he came up to thank me, you know, why? He said because he had this neurological disorder, genetic, where the, his blood vessels in his brain were scrambled, he said. I haven't got a clue. He c did tell me the name, but I can't remember these long names. So it's all scrambled. He had to have this very painful operation. It's only very rare that anybody has this anyway. And apparently the, the experts were in Singapore. So he flew down to Singapore, had this expensive, painful operation. And then, okay, but then it scrambled up again. And that was really rare. There's only about two cases ever in the world where this thing recurred. And he was going to face, he was only a young, young guy, and his wife was pregnant again, a second child. 
And he said, could I go through this really painful operation again? And he said, well, I've got another kid coming on the way, so I should. So he, he went to the hospital there, and they gave him the, the scan, yeah, he needed to be done. And then that night, because he'd heard about me doing all this stuff, he did this really meditation, he had to. So he got into very deep meditation. We were really blissing out, let go. And when they gave him the scan the next morning, he had to put this frame on his his body, he had to actually you know, screw this, the, this frame into his bones, it was very painful, but had to do it. And then they said, we'll give him another scan. And that's when they, they came back and said, just hold on a few moments, we're having a discussion. And they showed him the scan again and said, your brain is unscrambled. It's okay, we don't need to do the operation. And he came up to me and said, almost certainly, that meditation you taught me, don't know how it worked, but it unscrambled. Weird. Well, that's happened so often. That's one of the reasons why. Only when you really get still, really still, and your body vanishes, that's when it starts to heal itself. When you're out of the way, you control any messing around, doing this, doing that, that's a problem. So, that's the art of disappearing. Not fully gone to the end yet, but just seeing how your body vanishes and you get the access to the mind and know what your mind actually is. Direct experience. Okay? Any questions? Okay, let's disappear. I'm going to do just about 10 or 15 minutes of guided and then I'm going to go for another 40 minute meditation. So sitting here, closing your eyes. People just need to adjust their body or just to go find a seat or need to go to the toilet or something. It does happen. So get your body comfortable. You can't allow your body to disappear if it's not comfortable. Just the body won't go. Just like in bed at night, if you can't find a comfortable position, if you're too hot, too cold, you can't go to sleep. So take time. Mindfulness of your legs. How are your legs? Are you comfortable? You can adjust your legs, be really aware of them. Spend some time caring, being there for your legs. Once your legs are been attended to, up to your butt. Are you okay down there, buttocks? Do you need adjusting? From the buttocks to the back. Give your back a good stretch, loosening it, finding the best position. You won't find a perfect position, but you can find something which you can maintain awareness of. And don't need to bother with it, because it's comfortable enough. Your hands, lap, or on the, ne on the knees, wherever your hands can be comfortable. Just check them first of all. Your shoulders, loosening them like a bunch of strings pulled at both ends, 
let them go. So I think we have access. In your neck. You can move your neck back and forth until it's really nicely balanced. If you have a cough, attention to that itchy place in your throat. Just be with it, comfort it until it's really relaxed. Some of you have not got any rotation there, so you can go up to your face. Muscles around the eyes, the mouth. For me, my itchy nose. Just be with it as long as you need. Being aware, knowing what makes it worse, knowing what makes it less of an irritation. Really go inside of it rather than trying to escape. Just like that similar last night of the anger eating monster. Welcome, monster. Thank you for coming to visit me, being kind, non-aggression, gentleness, making peace with your irritation. See if that lessens the irritation. Just like with the mosquitoes in Thailand, you made peace with them, then they disappeared. Once the body's relaxed, you can let it go and look at your peaceometer. How peaceful are you? How much are you fighting? How much are you accepting? Fighting, aggression, comes from ego, sense of self. Makes matters worse. Letting go, making peace. Open the door of your heart is part of metta, letting go. A sense of self disappears here. It's just nature doing its thing. And see if you can find some joys and happiness and delight in peace of mind and rest of body. The effort is forcing your attention onto the object. Developing delight is allowing the object to draw you in to it. To see the beauty in an itchy nose. See the beauty in peace. See the joy in a, in a mind that is free. 
And don't pay attention to the thoughts. Pay more attention to the experience that the thoughts try unsuccessfully to capture. Just the experience. Just being. No need to describe. And see how peaceful you can become. I'm going to be quiet now for about 20-25 minutes.
this to the end of the meditation is how do you feel? How relaxed is your body? How peaceful your mind? The joy and the peace The end of the meditation is an opportunity to learn, to reflect, understand what works and what doesn't work. I will now ring the gong three times. <laughs>